Hello, my name is Melanie McCabe, and I am doing a reading for the Bad Mouth Poetry Series. Thank you to Rebecca Aronson for making this possible. I'm going to be reading from my new book, The Night Divers, which is just out from Terrapin Books. Many of the poems um, in this book are elegies. I lost my sister in 2015, and um, this first poem, The Night Divers, which is the title poem, um, stems from that experience. Each night we dropped quarters for each other into the shaking green light of the hotel pool, testing our metal and our lungs in the still scary plunge into the deep end. Less than an hour from closing, we were often the only swimmers in this abandoned world. All other children out on the teeming boardwalk, appended to a parent's hand, or already bathed, pajamaed, lulled in the laugh track of a sitcom, struggling to stay awake through a flickering blue hypnosis. My sister and I were proud rebels in our contrary allegiance to this chlorine-scented center of the earth. Ringed by balconies draped in bright beach towels, forsaken by those who chose to confine their holidays to sunlight and hubbub. If far off, we could hear the bells and cries of Funland, or the shrieks of teenagers chasing the selves they were becoming faster than they knew. That ruckus could be swallowed and expunged by one dive into the water where bubbles and our heartbeats were the only sounds that lasted. I have no memory of being watched, though I suppose we were. What has stayed with me all those years later is only our two bodies pushing, kicking again and again toward a bottom that was lit and well marked. And then the quick pivot, the surge for air that we never doubted would be awaiting us when we returned for it. Um, this poem is called From the Mountain. It borrows some of its phraseology from the Sermon on the Mount, but I certainly made some changes. From the Mountain. Do not be anxious about your life, this frail thing you keep in a box of cotton. What you shall eat or what you shall drink is waiting up a sleeve or in water hopeless focused into wine nor about your body, what you shall put on, for it is gift wrap only, and men will shake you to see what's inside. Look at the birds of the air, envy them their thoughtless swoop and wing beat. They neither sow nor reap nor cringe at a pinch of too ample thigh, and yet for them the mud seethes with worms and seeds twirl on the wind. Consider the lilies of the field, how instinct tips them naked in the midst of twitching bees, how they lean to the landing, a buzzer to bloom. They neither toil nor spin, yet they are as sated as any lovers tangled in the white sheets of morning. Do not be anxious then, about your life. Do not pop anodynes, toss back chardonnays, or cover the sharp edges of your brain with pain-proof corner guards. Do not obsess about tomorrow, for tomorrow will obsess about itself. In fact, is already reading self-help books. Instead, let the day's own nail gnaws be sufficient for the day. Save your strength for the long nights spent tallying sheep or accruing dreams that would make even Freud afraid. Um, this is a 
poem called If There Are Ghosts. It, um, my sister and I used to always say to each other, even when we were young, that whichever one of us went first, the other would come back and, and visit the ones remaining. And um, the, this poem sprang from that idea. If there are ghosts, they're hapless. Not even crafty enough to rap upon the glass or help the wind to push open a door we thought was closed. Somewhere, they must rail at their inefficacy, must kick and peek at the impotence of their changed selves. If they have voices, not even dogs can hear them. If ghosts have a language we can listen to, then it is static, white noise, something so omnipresent that we have to remind ourselves it is always there in the air, just below the air we know. If we invite them in, bid them sit down in the chair we've drawn up next to our own, how will we know if they've complied? Not even the heat of our palms that we extend in supplication will alter a degree, though perhaps their own hands answered ours as soon as we asked, covered ours with a colorless and glacial longing. Their poor advertisements for the other side. We pine for testimonials, a four-star system of reviews before committing ourselves. But the dead are lousy salesmen and we must purchase nonetheless. It's a poem called The Sound of It. Um, when I wrote it, I was trying to conjure up uh, memories from when I was very young um, and, and all the memories are oral there that can be heard, the sound of it. Every August night knew the hum of that old deco fan my father brought to the marriage from his apartment in the city. I threw my voice into its dangerous blades to hear myself warble as if underwater. A darker song pressed itself against the screen, mingled with crickets, with the turning over of Chevy engines, their sudden radios blaring Motown or the Stones. It was there in the laughter that broke the night, in the shrieks of teenagers I'd been told were up to no good, or in the blue streak cussed by the man with open windows and a wife none of us had ever heard. I felt that song in the floorboards, in the pounded ground where my sister ran and trapped lightning in her tight hands. But from the kitchen, my mother sang hymns above a percussion of plates and silver settling back into drawers. That clink of knife on knife, spoon on spoon, just beneath her gospel, Beneath that burden she would lay by the riverside. It came for me a baseline, a rhythm I let lull me into living as though someone waited for me on that far shore. Uh, this is also a poem that um, harkens back to very early memory. It's called From the Back Seat. Before we had ever heard of mandatory restraints, of Newton's laws of motion, my sister and I moved through summers and over interstates, unbuckled, loose as picked apples in the back seat of a 1955 sky blue Pontiac sedan. Beyond the rush and buffet of air through always open windows were cornfields broken by rest stops and bird spattered picnic tables. Lanes of concrete bordered by gullies glinting with green shards of bottle glass. The hazy shimmer of heat made our skin stick to the vinyl, our hair to our faces. As we dozed over miles, we did not have to count or navigate. Murmur of front seat voices lulled away for letting go of the getting there, opened a hole through time that made 
the arriving seem both mystical and humdrum. If I could wish us anywhere now, it would be to one of those earlier journeys, lying head by feet across wherever we were going, driven by hands we knew. Before we learned there were other hands at the wheel, perhaps no hands at all. This is a poem that it began from a literal experience of a neighbor who had a dog that just wouldn't stop barking. Um, but as I wrote, it became something, something else. This dog. This dog has barked all day from a yard I cannot pinpoint. I do not think he has a collar. I do not think he has a name or surely someone would have called it or cursed it. I suspect that neither does he have a body except for muzzle, throat, and trembling. But the reverb of his deep yelp punctuates my air. This bark is the ping pong, the thrum whoosh of blood between my ears. This bark is the white noise of my waking up and my lying down. I have chewed my morning cereal and time to this dog. This bark has been my backbeat as I haul laundry down the stairs and up again, as I clink the clean china and silver from dishwasher to shelves. This bark has been the base as I peck these keys. This wolf is what's mine when all else is no longer. This dog has barked all day and I suppose will bark all night. I will dream dog dreams if I dream at all. Sleep is the blank slate and all I can know is canine. All day, this dog, this dog, this dog has dogged me with yowl and paws of yowl. This bark has been my bouncing ball to follow and chase into a street of speeding words. Look both ways, listen both ways, and never ask, though you will long to ask, if anyone else hears this dog. This is the last poem I am going to read and it is called, I Want to Say No. I want to say no, to resist, but one day follows another like dingy geese into a pond. The paddle around the leaf-clotted perimeter, obligatory and grim. I wake each morning in the wrong body, baffled, and dress the knees, breasts, pores of a mystery I wonder if anyone will solve or want to. The eyes I paint aren't fooling anyone. Sideways at the mirror I peep hard right to catch the woman others give my name. Try to smooth her like a rumpled bed, but the knack is no longer mine. And still, I set this face toward the new day, imagining that there might yet be someone who will take my syllables between his lips and tease from them a rhythm I can sway to, refusing to give me back to the glass, who will shake the maraca to buzz and loose the seeds trapped inside imposter bones. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. And um, thank you again to Rebecca for making this possible.